Before we jump into this episode, I'd like to invite you to join this community to hear more interviews that will help you become happier, healthier, and more healed. All I want you to do is click on the subscribe button. I love your support. It's incredible to see all your comments, and we're just getting started. I can't wait to go on this journey with you. Thank you so much for subscribing. It means the world to me. The number one health and wellness podcast. Jay Shetty. Jay Shetty. The one, the only Jay Shetty. Uh, uh, uh. Please welcome to On Purpose, Montero Lil Nas X. Thank you so much for being here. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to talk about stuff. I'm happy to talk about stuff too. And I wanted to start off with, I know that you love time travel. Yeah. Yeah, I heard you were obsessed with time travel. And when I heard that, I was like, that sounds like something I'd love to hear more about. Where does that obsession come from? Where does that come from? I love the idea that you can go and change anything in the past mm. or go to the future to like to see what's going on. I guess it's it's like a form of escapism that I just really enjoy, you know, and I like to explore it in my art a lot. Yeah. yeah. Where have you explored changing things in the past? Like what what would be fascinating to, for you to visit? Changing in the past? You know what? When I was younger, I always thought like that's something I would want to do. But as I grow older, I, I don't think I want to change anything in the past. I guess I want to go to the future and maybe ask myself like, what do I do now? I mean, because that's kind of like where I'm at in my life right now. It's yeah. like, what did what do, what did you do to get to where you are? Yes. So I know I'm in that place, but I'm not there right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Where did the fascination come from? Where did it originate from? Like, where did it originate yeah. from? I say the Back to the Future 2 movie. Not the first <laughs> I love one, that. but the second one. And a lot of Family Guy episodes when Brian and Stewie like go to the past. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. One of the things you said in the documentary was you said that Lil Nas X helped you understand more about Montero. Uh huh. And, you know, the documentary is called Long Live Montero. I wanted to understand from you who is Montero and who's Lil Nas X. I think Montero was at first like this very shy, super insecure kid. And you know, had big dreams, but I guess was just very afraid of like even being like himself. And me becoming Lil Nas X, it was almost a persona, you know? And he could kind of just do whatever he wants and he can do anything and he can move on to the next thing and and not really be pigeon held to like anything, you know? Mm. And he helped Montero morph into that person. Mm. Mm. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. And was Lil Nas X, even if not by name, was that a character and energy that you harnessed when you were young? Was that a feeling you had when you were young? Or was it something that evolved through time? I think it's something that evolved through time, like through music. I think my enthusiasm or just like my hunger to grow musically, like pushes me to do things in my personal life that I would not do. Mm -hmm. And it's like not even just my personal life anymore because it's like public now. And I know if I'm not able to do those things, I can't continue to be Lil Nas X, or at least that's how it works in my head. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people can relate to that. I think we all have the little kid inside of us that's insecure and anxious and yeah. doesn't know how people are going to react. And I think we all feel like we wish we had an alter ego or a version of ourselves that was stronger and bolder and more courageous. What what kind of qualities does Lil Nas X have that you love and adore? I feel like Lil Nas X knows how to navigate any situation. He knows how to find his way out of things that may seem like very like dark and daunting. And he helps Montero do that. And I feel like that's one of the reasons why I call it Long Live Montero, because I, I still hope that innocent little boy inside of me like remains you know because i think you need that balance of you know that courageous and you can do whatever and still like scared like fearful but excited you know yeah so it's not like you're trying to remove the fear you just you actually want to protect that innocence i want to protect that innocence and i don't i think it's less like removing the fear and more so being able to do things even when fearful. And I it's like I'm showing the the younger me that exists within within me, like you can do this. 
You yeah. can do this. We can do this. It's going to be scary, but but let's go for it and see what happens. So there was this quote in the documentary where you said, my mind is hardwired since I was a kid that if you F up one time, you have to quit the whole thing. And my question is, when have you felt that you've done that in life? Or have you ever felt that kind of fear and then push through because little Nas X came through? You know, after the success of like Old Town Road and whatnot, I had like this dark like period of like, oh God, like what do I do? And I put out like my song Holiday, like before, like right before Montero came out. And it just wasn't living up to what I had hoped for. And like I was in a hotel room and I was just like telling myself like how much like I hate myself, you know, just like how do how did you let this how did you mess this up and wow. and how did you get here and like it's nothing we can do now like there's no reason for us to be here and I guess that's like the childish like like brat inside of me that is not comfortable working from the ground up you know mm -hmm. and in my introduction to the music industry was already at the top you know yeah. like it's it's a hard thing to <laughs> live from yeah. in, in a sense, you know what I mean? Abs absolutely. Yeah. So it's, it's the hardest I mean. thing to follow up with one of the most successful <laughs> drops yeah. of all time. Yeah. How did you process that? I knew I was gonna do it. I didn't know how I didn't know how I was gonna continue. But what it took was me bringing out another side of myself, which was like Montero, call me by your name. And with that though, I had to let go of this um this like child like innocence like the public hat with me i guess yeah i want to dive into your uh childhood actually i was going to ask you like what what would you believe would be your favorite memory growing up like if you were to close your eyes right now and think about atlanta georgia what's the vision or the visual that comes to mind or your heart that resonates and connects with love i went immediately to this one but i don't even know if it's mine's but it's like me in front of my like grandma's house and I'm just like running around the tree. Like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that's beautiful. But I feel like that's one of my first memories, you know? Yeah. And it's just like bliss. Where was that? Like what, where was the house? What did it look like? What do you see? It was actually an apartment and it was, um, it was in Bankhead Courts, Atlanta. It was like basically the hood, you know what I mean? But at that time, you know, everything felt all right. So, yeah. Yeah. And how old are you in this memory or this? I feel like age? I was maybe like five. Wow. It was right before the tree got cut down too. Yeah. Kind of symbolic in a way. In what way? I don't know. I guess um, life increasingly became more like real. Mm. Things started to happen within like, you know, my family life. And also at that time, recognizing even at that age, like, you know, my sexuality and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it, you know, became like a rocky like ship mm. from that moment. Is that when you started to become more aware of your sexuality? Was that an age that it started to become? Yeah, I mean, cause that was a, the age I started to become like aware of myself and mm -hmm. it was also like, becoming aware of the world around me, you know? And it's like, oh, this thing that's really bad that nobody seems to like. Mm. I happen to be that thing, but maybe, I'm, maybe you know, maybe it's not that bad, but also, you know, God's like probably super mad at me. And I don't want God to think I'm like being disrespectful or anything. I'm, And it's like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. All those things that I feel like I shouldn't be thinking about it, like, Six. <laughs> Definitely. That's a lot. That's heavy to be thinking about at six. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot, I think, for anyone to be processing at six years old. It's a lot of things to be questioning. I mean, you in that memory, you talked about your grandmother. And I know that your, when your great-grandmother passed, that was the first person that was close to you that you lost. Yeah. And that was when you leaned into music. Mm -hmm. How old were you when that happened, considering that memory you have that you just visualize... How old were you when that happened and how did that make you lean into music? You, you know, I actually, that actually happened when I was maybe 18. So, wow. but at that time, 
my dad had already had custody because I used to live with my grandmother from like when I was like um, like five until like eleven, and I was just like the golden child. I was like spoiled, and like I got so much love, and I was like, you know, I was the baby of the family. So once my dad got custody of us, you know, he played like much more like hardball kind of vibes. And I didn't see my grandmother as much, but mm. she was still like number one person in my heart when I like thought about like love. And, you know, around 16 or so, like I was told she had cancer and it was, it was like, the, it was like this thing that I was like, oh, it, it can't be true. And I kind of just like tried to forget like it exists. And I'm like, well, she's still alive. Like, you know, maybe that was just like. Denial. Yeah, I think it was like a lot of now, even when like when I was around her, like, you know, noticing that she was like getting skinnier and like like looking different and she would like say things like, you know, uh, I'd be like, Grandma, I love you. And she'd be like, you know, I, I don't love myself and, and stuff like that. And it was just, it was really hard to like hear and listen to this person that you have so much love for, like lose like faith in life. Mm. and just like the world in general and it's like it's also the person that has took on a role of being the back of the family for so many people like you know of the the person you know the grandmother like she has yeah. like the family reunions she has everybody over for thanksgiving she watches the kids like that's like a big thing in the black community and whatnot and and now like you know she i guess like feel feels cheated by life and you know i guess i could feel that through the way she would carry herself at that time. Mm. And so it was really hard once she passed. And it was something I tried to like brush over. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. I actually lost my uncle when I was around around your age at that time. And he was, he also was diagnosed with throat cancer. Yeah. And I was really close to my uncle. He was, he taught me how to drive. He helped me get my first job. He used to own like a news shop and, you know, sell newspapers and stuff. So he would like, let me work out and work in the shop and make a little pocket money. And, yeah. and then when he died, it was really interesting for me because I was getting more into spirituality at the time. And he was really angry that I was getting into spirituality. And so he was so mad at me. And like, you know, when he was really, really unwell, he'd be like, well, I hope you're not going to get spiritual. And I hope that's not going to be your path. And so he was kind of losing that positive spark. He was always like this positive energy. And then towards the end of his life, he was more angry than anything else. And it was, uh, yeah, it was an interesting experience going, you know, going from someone that, again, loved me so much, helped me so much, someone that I was very close to, to then feeling like he actually didn't like who I was becoming. How did you feel your grandmother's love evolved for you? I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry oh. about that. Oh, no. Thank you. For, uh, you, you. You inspired me to be vulnerable and share it back with you because, you know, I guess we both lost someone that we cared about at a similar time. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, how did your grandmother's love evolve for you from that five to eleven age when you were living with her? Like, how do you how do you think she loved you that stayed with you? I guess that's like afterwards, five. Um, oh, like during the time. Both. You know, my grandmother's um, like one of those things that that she really loved when you know life. I guess wasn't like great, like where we lived, and you know our like financial situation, and just like you know, the, what comes with, you know, getting older in life. And, uh, you know, I got, I got all the love. I got all the love. And, you know, sadly, my siblings got the other end of that stick, I guess. And, you know, around the time my dad got custody of us, I didn't feel like that special child anymore, which is probably good for my <laughs> young ego, you know? like feeling like I had to be like that one all the time. And I guess I kind of stopped seeing my grandmother as much. Mm -hmm. I'd go over there like a lot of the weekends and whatnot, but you know, it was just like the thing that I, I can't be there anymore. Mm -hmm. And and then eventually like she passed away and it was just like, it was very confusing. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the first song that you made after her passing or anything that, any music that came from that? I made a song called like Carry On and I was it was pretty much about how I like felt like very selfish about not being there when she passed away, mm. when I was supposed to be there that day, you know, but I was so stuck on social media, you know what I mean? And I was so 
like really like into Twitter and trying to, you know, build that, even though I know my grandmother's like on her last days. And it was just like, I just felt like very selfish because it was, you know, like this person that showed you so much love, showing you so much love and you're not there because you're like uh, trying to get these people's attention online. Mm. Yeah, I think a lot of people can relate to that too. You get so obsessed with your career or a direction or a path and it's working and it's winning and there's momentum. Yeah. And and we all kind of, you know, and you, and you were young when that happened for you, but a lot of people into their 30s, 40s, 50s will, you know, attest to that and put their hand up and say, you know, they've done that where they've over-prioritized their career to their relationships. How has that shifted how you've lived since then? Like that reflection or realization that you've had? I'll be honest. I'll say I was still kind of like that way up until these last like maybe two years mm. of, I guess, my break from like music or whatnot. I've started to really actually like cherish like being with my family and stuff because it's like these people are growing up so fast. Like the like the like my nieces and nephews, yeah. and you, you know, you see that on TV and you feel like it's like cliche or whatnot, but it, it happens like so fast. And I feel like the older I get, the faster these years like somehow go by. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, and that's a wise realization to have at 24, I'll tell you that. Like that's that's early. I think most people that I speak to, again, like you're saying, we hear the cliche, we see it. But I'd say most people don't get to that realization until they're like 30, 40, maybe even later on in life, you know? It's yeah. it's a weird one because you kind of feel like you'll be the exception. Yeah. Right? Like everyone feels like they'll be the exception. Maybe their life will go slower. They'll have time for everything. Uh, there was another line in the documentary that really resonated with me. There were so many things. That I, I can't wait for everyone to watch the documentary, honestly, because as someone who knew your music, was aware of you, I felt like... I got really invited into your stream of consciousness during it. And I so appreciated, I found your thinking out loud to be extremely comforting, even though we've never met each other and we don't know each other. Yeah. And there were so many things that you said where I was like, oh, I can relate to that in some way. And this was, this was another one. You said, a lot of the times when I'm scared, it's when I'm about to do something that will change my life drastically. And I was going to ask you, what scares you the most right now? Or what do you feel fearful about right now that you think might be on the verge of changing your life drastically? I think just like my place right now in my actual like career in like these last like couple of weeks, you know, I've never been here like mentally and actually like physically, you know, where you've like been so like focused and like zoned in on what you're doing and you push your art out into the world and it's kind of like received negatively by like a, the majority, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But then like also understanding why, you know, and, and having to like see it through. So I guess that's, that's where I'm at right now. And my next move, you know, the things that I'm planning on right now, I, I feel like somewhere in here, there's going to be this magical moment that I can't even take credit for. And mm. Yeah, I feel like that's that's going to squeak. I feel like that always happens. So Yeah, there's always magic in the messiness. Yeah. But it's not fun. <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah. It's, it's been a lot. Yeah. No, we'll, we'll get to that as well. There was, there was another line that kind of sparked what you just said now. You said, you talk about wanting a little bit of chaos. Like there's a part of you that likes a little bit of chaos. And I was going to ask you, what does positive chaos look like to Montero? And what does negative chaos look like? I right. think that the thing is, it's usually when I can control it. <laughs> I, I've lost, I don't, I don't think I have the grip on controlling it. I feel like it does a lot of what it wants now, you know? Yeah. I'm usually like strategic with things and I can kind of like move the conversation. But that's the chaos I like. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 kind of like a kid that starts a fire and it's in the, under control. Yeah, and then as it's opposed like, to a forest fire. Yeah, it's to like in the I'm just like, oh, this is not to it was wasn't supposed to this is not my chaos. Yeah. But yeah, I like to keep things interesting or whatnot and yeah, yeah lead the conversation around it, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think all I think all of us love that. We I love and I appreciate the honesty. Like I think we all love 
chaos that's under control and that we can control yeah. drama that we can control but then as soon as it and and it's funny because it always starts like that right like even a forest fire starts because there was a little controllable fire but then it spread really really fast yeah and that feeling of things leaving your grip is like the most uncomfortable feeling in the world when you feel something just like it's the worst it's, it's the worst feeling ever uh, yeah. When when you feel that way, when you've created something and then it takes a life of its own, so you've experienced it positively and challengingly. How do you process that? Or how do you allow yourself to be okay with creating something controlled and then it becomes fully chaotic and out of how your do control? I allow it? It can get almost like depressing, but you know, actually depressing and it can you can become like super angry with yourself, as I said like earlier or whatnot. Yeah. And yeah, I mean it, it it gets that deep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because you said recently, and as you brought up the last two weeks, you said you said you felt like you really messed up this time. And I was like, you know, and you were saying that it affected your mental health, right? Like it really felt like it affected your mental health. And I'm like, why did you feel that way? And, and in what way does it affect your mental health? I already kind of like explained the situation, you know, in that video. But it was, it was this thing that, artistically it was just supposed to be like i'm returning like i'm back i'm back like him you know what i mean and it turned into this whole thing where it was me trying to dunk on christians or something and that was never like what it was never and then and then i then i looked at the video with me like eating like the communion or whatnot and i was like okay this looks really bad on paper this thing that i thought was just like a little jokey, fun video. I also had to think about like how many of my family members are like Christian, like my grandmothers and stuff and, you know, like aunties and, and things like that. And I'm like, wow, like, do they see this as that too? If they do, like, you know, that's, that's really messed up and it's, you know, it made me sad. And then, you know, on top of that, like seeing like actual fans, like, turn and say like oh why is he doing this why does he keep messing with these people and i i think another thing was messages got turned around and because one got turned around the idea of montero call me by name which is me like taking ownership of this place everybody tells me i'm going to go and that was just turned into oh he's teaching christianity a lesson when that's not the case you know and now this thing was like, oh, I'm Jesus. I'm I'm back like Jesus, which is, if anything, it's 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 like homage to Jesus. It's like this guy that made the greatest comeback of all time. And I'm not the first artist to do such a thing. That message like turned around and I didn't know, I didn't know how to like do anything with it. It wasn't my chaos anymore. It was the world's and anything anybody said was true because that's who I am as a person. I'm I'm this troll and I want to make these people mad. Mm. And so everybody can run with that. Mm. And there's nothing I can do about that. I can I can say as many things as I want, but knowing my history, they look right, I look wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the way you addressed it and you're addressing it right now is is helpful and useful to people because I think it came across very clearly to me and it does today too even sitting with you like it's not something you're trying to disrespect or mock. But for people who feel that way, what would you say to them? Like for someone who feels that that is what it is, how what would I you say to them? Yeah. What would you want them to hear? It's probably a better question. You know what's you know what's crazy? I I I feel like I've said, you know, I apologize for the communion thing. On on, on that note, everything else, I'm not sorry about. I don't I don't think I did anything wrong. You know what I mean? And it's like I've also been making like a lot of like gospel music like to to like God and and like like my spiritual side and I hate that this whole thing is turned into like a mockery which it isn't you know mm. Yeah no thank you for sharing that I appreciate it and and I think there's also like I was going to actually maybe maybe that's a good thing to talk about like obviously your father's a gospel singer right Yeah well, I would love for you to talk about your relationship with your father to give kind of context to the conversation we're having right now because i'm not sure how many people are aware of your deep christian roots so walk walk us through some of your relationship with your father and how that's evolved which comes across in the documentary for sure i feel like me and my father has 
have grown closer as I got older because the version of me that he saw wasn't really me. It was the version that I presented to him. So as I've like come out and whatnot, like even before I came out though, my dad, um, well, when I did initially came out, to, when I initially came out to my dad, he was just like, you know, the devil may be tempting me or whatnot. And it's definitely taken its own journey because now like my dad is like, yo, do you have a boyfriend kind of vibe? Like you could tell me about that <laughs> stuff. Like you can let me know that. And, you know, he even came to me, he even came with me to like a gay club with like my brothers and sisters one time, just like dancing and stuff. It's it's been a complete like um, one. How does that feel like? Because from going from you know coming out to your parents and your father saying, "Yeah, you know the de I mean that is a really extreme, obviously, reaction on one end, and now coming with you to a gay club like how does that transition even? A how does that transition happen? B how does that feel? I feel like it was an overtime thing and. Also him like learning me as a person, like I feel like him seeing me in interviews and stuff like that was like the same for everybody else. Like every, mm. I feel like the entire world started to see me, my brothers and sisters, my family, everybody started to see me at the same time. Mm. You know what I mean? I feel like before that I was just very like meek about everything. So over time, you know, with Call Me By Your Name coming out and and like the entire like Montero album like roll out and me inviting him and like listening to my songs on my last album. That's how he learned about me. And I feel mm -hmm. like him hearing me from my own mouth and like in the world and seeing me in the world, like help him understand me more. Mm -hmm. And I feel like over time he was like, okay, I, I, I understand now. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It feels like you've also always had this compassion for people who don't always understand you. Like even when, you say when you when you when you first told your father like and he had that reaction of maybe the devil's tempting you you actually understood that like there was a part of you that went oh i get that and then there's other parts in the documentary true when you have protesters outside yeah. and again you're like i'm actually happy that they have something that they belong to and they stand for like there's a there's a compassion and context that you seem to have even when you're the one who's trying to express yourself, you can see how it's hard for people to digest that. Would that be fair to say? For sure. I mean, the truth is I feel like over like the last couple of years, I've learned not everybody is against you. It's just like against you, you know? There's a lot of like learned things, you know, a lot of things over time people have latched onto and in their brains is hard to let go of. So they see you as this way because of something that was, you know, far beyond their control, things they've been taught since they like grew up, you know, like my dad has been taught and like shoved in his head, you know, and and everybody in the world, like we all have like ideals, like put into our brains. And I don't want to like try to be a thing where it's easy to paint people who don't like you as like haters or just like, evil and like bigot and whatnot. But it's like these people just genuinely don't understand you and inside of their mind like it's it's like fear you know it's like fear and it's it's like discomfort and there's all these things that the human mind wants to run from you know and i understand that because i still have those things yeah we all we all see things in others that we don't understand and as soon as we don't understand something the most human emotion is to feel fear any sort of change makes us feel fear, any sort of uncertainty. So if someone, we look at someone and we feel uncertain about them, it generally sparks fear. That's how we've almost been conditioned yeah. as humans to just feel fear. And so, as you've said before, you said some people see me as the satanic devil that is going to ruin the world. Like when you, when you say things like that, what are you actually trying to do? When people see you that way, like what I'm interested in is when people see you that way, what are you actually trying to portray that sometimes gets seen that way? It's more so um, taking all these things that I believe have been used to like demonize me and a lot of other people and these conspiracies. And it says, okay, this is what this looks like. Is, is this what you actually want to see? You know what I mean? Is this... Mm is this who you think I am? Mm. 
okay, I'm going to do those things. I'm going to do those things. You think I'm like this, so I'm going to do these things. When you're building a new album, building a new song, making a music video, what's your artistic process? Like, where does it start? Like, like what happens? Is it you taking notes? Is it journaling? Is it working with your team, your dancers? Like, how does how does new work get created in Montero's world? Can it, can we pause for a yeah, second? Yeah, of course we can. Of course we can. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm with you. You. I'm gonna step outside for. Of course you a can. Minute. Of course you can. Yeah, absolutely. Of course you can, man. Of course you can. <sighs> Let's open up there. Take your time. Got you. What would you like to say? Where is where is your heart? Well, first I'll say what I said out there. Um, I'm trying to be authentic and say, you know, words from my heart, but you know, I feel like it ends up sounding rehearsed. And I guess um, yeah, I'm I'm trying to get there, but yeah, I'm doing my best. But we can move from, we yeah. can move from this. Yeah. 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 And and all you can ever be asked for is doing your best. So can't ask for anything more. And I think we're all in that, we're kind of all in that pressure of trying to be authentic selves. But then, you know, there's that, there's that famous meme on social media that I see all the time that says, society says, be yourself. And then society says, no, not like that. Yeah, and, and I think you know we all kind of spend some. Time oh, that's there. so, that's authentic, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, society doesn't really want like people to be like themselves and stuff like that, yeah. just like to a degree. Yeah, we yeah we want everyone to be authentic in a way that makes us feel good. And the th- the truth is, is if everyone was authentic, oh boy, this world would be insane. What would it be like? It, it it would have some great things, but definitely like some terrible things too. Yeah. Yeah. So it's probably better that everyone's a little less authentic. <laughs> it's an interesting is conversation. It Authenticity is an interesting conversation. I think it depends on what you see as better. Like yeah. positive and light. Does that automatically equals like better? Like, cause it's I feel like some dark things help bring light, mm. you know? Mm-hmm balance Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah 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 it's almost like i feel like even internally when you're doing the work shadow work and stuff like that yeah you have to go through a lot of darkness you know you gotta understand like what you are capable of and Mm -hmm. and like who you are and decide not to do like like that that bad that you could Mm -hmm. do you know Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah do you do a lot of inner work is that kind of i know you became spiritual and you got involved in a, a bit of your own spirituality. What, is, what does that look like, exploring your own spirituality? What does that look like in your definition, in your words? Yeah, I do a lot of like inner work and understanding like who I am and, but also like the, and like trying to let go of the pressures of, I guess, what I feel like society a lot of times will want me to be. Mm-hmm. You know, like this big, brave, like champion for the community, which, you know, I can't be at all times. You know what I mean? I just want to do me sometimes. Of course, like, I want to do what I can, but I want it to come naturally. And Is there a lot of pressure sometimes, it feels like, to always have to be? I was joking about it with someone else the other day. Like, whenever I'm around someone, I always feel the pressure that I have to say something wise <laughs> because <laughs> because that's the the kind of you know and so like when i'm around some it's kind of like being around a comedian and you they have to be funny yeah right? like yeah it's i think like, it's exactly that yeah i think it's exactly that even like with the funny thing sometimes you know because yeah. i'm an online yeah. troll and stuff yeah. i'm like i don't want to be funny right now i want to i want to i don't know i want to eat this food and and you know not really talk to you i want to scroll on my phone a little bit and eat this yeah. food yeah. but the whole thing like even with like montero still like riding on my back like we're talking about it right now and me like featuring the video and stuff and it's like that's just what I want to do it wasn't I, I'm not always trying to like make a deep message I guess like I guess yeah, yeah if that makes sense yeah so sometimes you're just trying to have fun not even just trying to have fun it's just a lot of things I do most things through my art 
are for me. And just thankfully, other people can see mm -hmm. it as helping them. It's coming as a form of self-healing and self-expression. Mm -hmm. And then if it connects with people, I, then... I, like, I yeah. pray it connects with you. Yes. But I don't know. I'm not, I'm not trying to be a martyr, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, Rick Rubin was here a few months ago. And he was saying something similar. He was saying that he thinks that true art and true creativity is not made for consumption. Yeah. In that it is consumed and it is loved and it is connected with, but it wasn't created thinking, well, how are we going to find the thing that connects? It's creating something that comes from within. Would you agree with that? Does that hold I true? I agree completely. I like Rick Rubin. Yeah. Yeah, I like his book. I yeah. only, only scam, only like skim through it, but I yeah. like it. Yeah, yeah, it's a great book. Did you? Uh, when when do you feel you're connected to your most authentic three hundred and sixty self? Like, what are you doing when you feel that way? Because I know in the documentary, it seemed like when you're with your dancers, who are also your friends, that felt like a form of self expression and connectedness, where you feel like you can let go and be funny and be larger than life and be creative. Would you say that's where it comes through? I'd say if anything, it's when I'm creating music. And I guess that's like the thing that an artist should say or whatnot. But it's the truth when I'm like making a song and when I can completely like let go of how it's going to re be received, I just feel like one, you know, I feel like everything has come to me. All of my energy is not like all out into the world. Like every, like I feel like just one being like connected to everything. It's a feeling like I, I, I can't describe, like no amount of success will ever like equate to it. I don't know if I'll ever like find love that strong. I hope so, <laughs> but, but yeah. That's the, uh, I think that's the thing we're all looking for, right? Like we're all searching for like, and and it's almost like you can't manufacture it. Like you can't engineer it. It either happens or it doesn't. You can't fake it. Yeah. 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 You feel it sometimes and sometimes you don't. Yeah. Yeah. You said you wanted to stay the acceptable gay person at first and you didn't want to be the one that shoves it down everyone's throats. And then now we're talking about, again, being authentic. I think we're all always trying to... We're always trying to play again to what people around us wanting to be. And then, and then it comes out. How did you kind of go, well, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. I am going to allow myself to free I, myself. I feel like it's a push and pull, you know, because of course there's still parts of me that, you know, want to please the people around me. You know, I mean, I feel, I feel like that's the whole idea of like, something being successful a lot of the times mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we got to make sure it's packaged enough to be authentic but also able to be like digestible at mm -hmm. the same time. I almost feel like that's where we're all trying to exist. There's this, you, you said something that resonated with me that I, I was going to read something from F. Scott Fitzgerald. Yeah. And so he has this beautiful quote that I'm, I'm fully obsessed with right now. Mm -hmm. And it, and it, when I look at you as an individual, this is, and you can reflect on whether you, how you feel about it. So he said that the test of a first rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposing ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. In his words, one should, for example, be able to see that things are hopeless, yet be determined to make them otherwise. But the way I'm reflecting on you is this idea of like, you want to be doing things that are for the self, but then at the same time, it needs to connect to people. Like you want to be able to be who you are with your friends and your family. Yeah. And you realize that sometimes you've got to tone down parts of yourself, but then sometimes you don't want to, right? We're constantly trying to, all of us are trying to be two things almost. Yeah, for sure. Why is it so hard then? I don't know. And I feel like that goes back into the whole thing of like, we are like not in control mm -hmm. completely of things. Mm -hmm. Like no matter what you do, how much preparation or whatnot, it's not something you control. Like people are going to love stuff or they won't. Absolutely. You said about love there, you mentioned. How, do, how does finding love play a role in your life when, you know, it's not I think always... this year is the first year since 2021 that I'm going to be open to, like, finding love because I was kind of very closed off to it. It's like, no, 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 I need to focus. I have these, I have really, really big dreams that I don't want to share with everybody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have really, really big dreams, and it's like, 
I feel like anything that I can see as a distraction can get in my way. But at the same time, like that whole contradicting thing, love can help inspire you to make like even greater art. Mm. But, but you know, I wanted to just have my like phase of being young and having fun with yeah, a lot yeah. of people, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah so, absolutely. I know what you mean. Yeah. 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 But don't you think, again, it's it's interesting, right? Like, it is daunting. I agree with you. And yet I find that most people, of course, everyone's have a good time. I'm like that too. Like, I love laughing. I love having a great time. And at the same time, again, talking about the paradox or the contradiction, I also want to have meaningful connections because the last thing I want to do is have a superficial, artificial con like conversation with someone. So it's like this. It's funny how the things we find daunting are often things that even that person's kind of yearning for. Like, I don't think anyone's ever had a really deeply meaningful conversation and then walked away from it going, that was a waste of time, right? Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like, you're never yeah. going to say that. Like, you're never going to, you know, like I, I had a dinner with someone in London recently and it was a group of us in, in a similar industry and everyone was being vulnerable and we were laughing and connecting, but everyone's sharing their pains. And we walked away and no one was walking away going, God, that was the worst dinner. Everyone's going, to, yeah, everyone's going, that's the, one of the best dinners we've ever had. And, and I find that with artists, it's, it's, it's hard to have that, I guess. Like, it's hard to find that. And so do you, do you feel like the dancers are where you find that? Like, is that a place of safety and a place of joy? I feel like that's definitely a place of joy. Yeah. And I don't, like, get super serious with them or barely, like, anyone for... <laughs> For that matter, you know, it's only it's, me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, I, I feel like I share most of my like therapy sessions at home alone with myself mm -hmm. and my cats in the distance. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like talking out loud to myself when all the voices in my head are saying like the most crazy, terrible things you would ever hear a person say. It's useful. Yeah. It's helpful. How how ridiculous can the voice inside your head get? Like what how like, far will it go? Ridiculous as in like, you know, that time that I told you about, like the hotel incident. Like, it's easy when you're like down or in like a in like a hard place for all those voices in your head to like gang up. It's like, okay, this is the time. <laughs> it's like everybody go, go, go. Yeah. And talking out loud can be that saving yeah. grace of a factor, like no, this isn't that bad. This thing isn't that terrible. We're going to get out of this thing. We've been through worse. We will go through worse. So we got to make sure we get out of this thing so we can know about the worst. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, like that That helps a lot. That's a great technique. Yeah, I fully agree. I think the when you're lost in your head and in the silence, oh my gosh, you have no idea which voice to follow, which voice to let lead. It's the worst when you're like, oh, this terrible voice has a point, you know? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> this one, this one's saying something maybe I should listen to. Yeah, yeah. It's like, no, he's not. Like, yeah. that's a terrible idea. Yeah. Have you ever used that technique where you label certain voices that you see as recurring and you give them a name and a, and a way? Because they say that that's a great technique of your inner critic, like giving it a name, giving it a personality. Have you, have you noticed certain ones that keep coming back? I don't give them a name per se. But as I said, like, I'm a spiritual being, mm. and I feel like just like me, like, I have my thoughts, my wants, and my purpose. That voice in my head was, you know, created by the universe. It, mm. it has a job, and I think its job is to give me just enough to fight against. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So it's like, I don't hate this voice. It's like, you're part of me. We're one. We're together. We're in this together. You're wow. doing your thing. I'm trying to do my thing. You know, but I can't listen. I can't listen to you on this. That, that's powerful. That that the ability to not yeah. The more we right, there's that famous saying that says the more you resist, it persists. Like it just keeps persisting if you keep kind of butting heads against it. And what you're saying is actually I don't hate it. I just I recognize it's, it's, it's like, a part I, of me. Yeah. I see. I know that's that's your thing. That's literally why you're here. I can't be mad at you for fulfilling your purpose. Like, yeah. Yeah, you have, that is that you do have that quality, like that ability to recognize that everything has its place and everyone has their place. Where does that come from? The compassionate, like parts of me, trying to make sense of everything. I feel like it's so easy to label everything as as like a as like a demon or just like a like a terrible, just like dark thing. But it's like this thing. It's it, it exists. It has emotions and it has feelings just like you. And it's yeah, yeah. just trying to do its thing. Yeah. yeah. There was this one statement that 
reminds me of what you're saying now. You said people feel a lot of things about me, but boy, do I love this kid yeah. in the duck. How is, how is that journey of I love this little Montero, this kid inside of me, how is that developed? Like, what has that taken for you to get to a place of being able to say that, like, I love this kid? Because I think that's a journey we're all on. I think, and it's like something everybody knows, but we we forget a lot, but we're literally just all like the same person in like a different life path. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And once I can really just understand and recognize that every single person has like these thoughts or a form of like these thoughts that I have in my head, I know I shouldn't like feel bad about where I am or what I think and, you know, what I'm doing because that's what this version of me is doing. Like, that's that's where I am. And I have to love him through it and, like, understand that he's going to make these, you know, mistakes and he's going to have accomplishments and he's going to have great times and he's going to have bad times and he's going to do amazing things and he's going to do terrible things. And and it's like um, I have to uh, allow him to grow through that. And me joining the world or anybody else and being hard on this kid is not going to help. Yeah, I was just saying the other day, I was saying to someone, you can't, guilt yourself into growth it's, it's impossible like you can't shame yourself or embarrass yourself into becoming better like when was the last time you made someone feel guilty and they were like yeah i'm gonna be the best person in the world now like it doesn't work that way yeah i think cliche as it is like you know love is really the the answer for that how does it feel i know you're gonna go today or tomorrow to show your family the documentary like how does that make you feel to be able, for them to be able to see this? I think I want to be very like self conscious, you know, <laughs> the whole time. Like, yeah, just just like, oh my god, like, what are they thinking about this? And, you know, I've I've said things in this documentary that they've never heard me, wow. like say, you know, or my perspective on like a lot of different things, and even them, you know, talking about them and how I feel close or not close with them. Yeah, it's a lot. Although, although it comes, yeah, it comes across, I'm hoping in a way that they can digest it. There's a lot of love you have for your nephew. Yeah. And and your relationship of him not wanting to see you differently. Uh, how is how is that relationship, like, progressed? And Because how old is he? He's, he's young. He's 11. He's about yeah. to be 12 this yeah. year. I feel like, you know, he's he's one of the only people in my family that calls me, like, 24-7. Wow. And, and I just really like appreciate that because, you know, before they get to like their age where they're just like too cool and whatnot, I'm happy to have like that person that still, I don't know, is inspired by me or still like loves me like all the same. And and yeah, yeah, throughout everything. What will he say to you when he's calling you up? Like what's the, <laughs> what, what is he doing? What's a 12 year old he, saying? You know kids like he, he will call and kind of just like say, yo, what's up? And then just be like silent for a minute. And and then and then it's like, yeah, I've been on Fortnite and what, like stuff like just like kid stuff. And I I love that. It were it, it makes things much smaller. Cause in my head where I have all these things that I feel like are the big grandest like problems of my life and blah, blah, blah. You know, he's he's like in school, like trying to get his grade up in science. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like these things. Yeah, it, it it keeps me, it keeps me like down to earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like when my mom calls me up and I've been doing, you know, whatever crazy thing. And then she's like, have you eaten today? Like, that's what like, she like cares the about. Little like, stuff. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. she's like, makes everything have much... you had your lunch? Like, have you taken your vitamins? Yeah. Like, that's what my mom <laughs> would say to me. And I'm like, mom, like, I'm at the White House or whatever it is. <laughs> she's just like, yeah, have you had your vitamins? Like, it's the best thing though. Yeah, yeah. it keeps you grounded, yeah. keeps you connected. And you're right. Like so often we just start getting lost in this, you know, this big vision of what we're doing and what we're yeah. creating. And it kind of just pops the bubble. Like, you know, they come along in this yeah. guy. Yeah, it's not that It makes deep. it much like smaller and easier to maintain in a way. Yeah, yeah. You said something about the family that really resonated. You said... How can we get everyone in a house within five years without me paying for it? And I was like, you know, what does that new level of relationship of desire mean to you? Like, what is what are you trying to create there? Or where does that thought come from? I feel like that opens a bigger, like, question or, like, 
current like problem in my life. I'm like not a little boy anymore. Like I'm a grown man and I have to take on like this, this like leadership role. And I feel like once you break society down, everything is still like tribes and whatnot. And I have tribes, you know, like, like on my family, like, like this is my tribe or, you know, like my, my team around me in my career, like this is my tribe. I have to get in the front of this and try to figure things out and like try to understand like how do these people work best? Like how can I get you, you know, to doing your best thing and how can I get you to doing your best thing so we can all progress? Because of course, you know, I got to get myself right first before I do anything, but it's like also I have to understand like how can I help you? I'm in this place. I believe the universe sent me here to try to, to try to fix things, you know? It's like how do I build your confidence up like with my brothers and sisters like how do I build your confidence up us all these people that grew up in these places where we've been told over and over in our life by even each other and our family members and and the world that we're not like how do I get you the confidence to to chase your own dream or if your dream's not something like grand grand you know how do I get you to I don't know be on my team and just something where you're happy and it's so hard to get people organized and organize things and realize that this is something I have to do because if I don't do it, it, it may not get done. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 And, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm at that place where I'm trying to figure that out. Yeah. I can understand that. It's, it's hard because you've got so many roles on your team. Then there's family, there's yeah. friends coming up. I mean, it's, it's hard and it's hard to put everyone on too. I mean, I've spoken to so many people who, you know, today, like, top musicians, artists, yeah. actors who've had that years ago where mm -hmm. friends wanted to move from their hometown and come and join the team. And then sometimes they didn't want to put in the work and sometimes they did and sometimes they made it. Like I know a, f a friend of mine who's, this person used to seat people at his shows 30 years ago and today mm -hmm. she's directing documentaries with him. That's amazing. Right? And it's like a beautiful journey and it's amazing for them to have. But then on the other end, you've also got friends who were given a route out but then they let the money and the fame and the drugs and alcohol and everything consume yeah. them. And you recognize it's almost like you can only give people opportunities, but they've got to take them for themselves. Yeah. And that's, that's hard to like come to grips with, you know, like you can give as many like speeches or, or talks or like as much guidance as you want, but it's just so hard to help some people up. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. But that's something that feels important to you. Yeah. Something that feels important is also something that, you know, it crushes you a little bit, you know, back to that whole like factor of you can't control this thing. Yeah. You can't, there's uh, nothing you can do about this. Yeah. I feel like this is, this is not a question that me and you can solve here at all because it is almost the question of life, but it's like, how do we, how do we deal with our lack of control every day? Like how, how do we deal with the fact that we can't, control things or how do you deal with the fact that you can't control everything in in on all of these it. areas yeah how have you have you found any coping mechanisms or? i have oh cool okay and i have one main coping mechanism and it's so silly but <laughs> it helps me through life a lot i'm excited and it's and it's like dude you're a gummy bear and i know it doesn't make sense <laughs> i love gummy bears so i'm it, listening but it's like all of this is in our head it's all like a journey in, in the grand scheme of things, as this individual, I am just a gummy bear. It's not that serious. It's not that deep. Keep moving forward. I'm, of course, it's a contradiction because it's everything to me. It means yeah. everything to me. It's 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 my whole being, but it's like, but I'm also a gummy bear. So it doesn't really matter if this thing, you know, yeah, it doesn't yeah, matter. Like, yeah. dude, relax, you know? So it's like a fight between those two. But that, me being a gummy bear is like, one of the only things that's going to get me through this really hard thing that I'm fight, fighting or facing, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. I like that. I like that. I've never heard it put that way. <laughs> so I like it. I like that it's silly. It's, uh, yeah, that idea of embracing our own insignificance. It's like we have our significance. We know what we're doing is important, but at the yeah. same time, we've got to embrace the insignificance of it's the like, irrelevance. It's like, yeah, like, re relax, like. Yeah. It's not that serious. It's super serious, but it's not that serious. <laughs> you know? Yeah. That's a funny conversation inside for sure. Yeah. There's another thing that came up was you said that 
if I settle into a house, I feel like I'll have to be there forever. And there's this idea of like, you know, there's a shot in the documentary with all your suitcases there and you're like, not sure about the couch. And I was wondering like, where does the fear of being somewhere forever come from? I think it's like the whole idea of like becoming comfortable, you know? And of course I do have like couches and stuff now. <laughs> I have like a new couch and I have like my cats, which I was very like hesitant to do. But, you know, I was I was very afraid of getting like super comfortable with my like Hollywood life. You know, I have like my house and stuff and now I'm going to get all my, my Grammys over here and I'm going to put my couch right there. And here's my Mona Lisa painting, like stuff like that. I was very fearful that once I did that, I'm just going to like relax all the time. But now I, I, I see it differently. It's like I want to relax sometimes to keep myself sane. And I am going to like put my house together because there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And I have to live because as I said, like this goes by so fast. Yeah. I, I'm 24, like going on 25. And I feel like, like two days ago I was 19, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like your home has to be a sanctuary for you, whatever that means for you. Like it fills and fuels you up for the crazy life you live. Cause I'm sure you're going on tour again. You will go on multiple tours across your lifetime. Like, the time that you are spending there, you want it to be comfortable. You want it to be re-energizing. What yeah. does that look to you? What does rest look like for you now? Like what does taking a break look like to you? Because you are someone who's ambitious and hardworking and driven. But now to get back up on that. I think I have one main thing and it's super simple. It's going to see a movie. Mm. I like to go and see a movie like, I don't know, some once, maybe twice, sometimes even three times like a week. And that's like my escapism moment or like my moment of like rest or away from everything, you know, like during my time, you know, when I dropped the artwork uh, for my last single and like, it was like a hellscape. I went to see this movie called Migration, which is like this animated movie about like birds, like flying places. And it's just like this fun, like childlike movie. And I was there. I was in that movie. That was my rest. That was my peace. That was my sense. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I love that. I love going to the movies too. Was that the most recent thing you saw? Was there anything else that kind of, uh, what's been the best movie you've seen this year? With the Oscars are coming up too. I think I want to see like Poor Things, but it was very dark. I seen Great that yet. movie, but very dark. What was, yeah. What was it like? I haven't seen it yet. What was it like? Yeah. It was like um, Emma Stone just giving like uh, an amazing performance. It was also like this movie that was, so weird, nothing like what I've seen before, like very like Ari Aster like vibes. You know what I mean? Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you're not giving it away. I really want to yeah, see it. Yeah, I don't want to give away the yeah, entire yeah, thing. I really want to see yeah. it. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. I love going to movies too. I'm a big, big I loved Oppenheimer last year. That have you seen that yet? I saw Oppenheimer, but it, you didn't it, it wasn't for me. Yeah, it wasn't yeah, for yeah. me. I'm yeah. a Nolan I'm a Nolan fan, Christopher Nolan fan, and like every movie he makes, I'm like, I love it when well, Oppenheimer, I got more of. Tenet was the one that was the hardest one to get. I don't know if you ever saw I that. I like Tenet. Yeah, I didn't so did get I. it, yeah. but I like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He makes movies. I love his movies because he's always creating things where it's not set up to be consumed like the average movie. Like you got to sure. You have Google to think on, about it. Yeah, you got to think. You have to look up and go on a forum or something and yeah, try to understand yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, I'm that guy like looking at every little graphic explaining like the time frame and, yeah. and, and everything else that comes with it. Uh, Montero, what is it that you know, what are you, what are you excited about over the next, you know, 12 months for you? What's something that's inspiring, pulling you and uh, pushing you forward right now for the next 12 months? I think the main thing I'm, I'm focused on is uh, picking myself up out of this, this uh, hole that I like feel that I'm in, you know what I mean? And trying to figure out which songs of the, hundreds or whatnot I've been working on suit me best for going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what does that process look like? Like, how do you, how do you actually do that in an actionable, practical way? I guess trying to feel which ones feel real to me and back to the other thing, but are also like consumable, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And how do you judge that? Because I guess like, how do you, as an artist, even are you just trusting intuition? Is there data? Is there prayer? Like how, yeah, what is that? <laughs> intuition plus like, I feel like spiritual like signs. Mm. Yeah. Walk me through the spiritual signs. I like that. For example, in my, my last song, you know, um, my last single, uh, Jay Christ, like I, I was kind of hesitant. I was like, is this, 
Is this where I'm going to get me to the next place? And every time I would think about it, I would magically like see a cross in the distance or something like that. I was like, okay, this is a part mm -hmm. of my journey. This is something, this is a threshold I have to cross through to get to the other side. Or for example, um, another one, and I was worried about like releasing Call Me By Your Name. I'm just like, oh my God, I don't know if I should. And then Good Days by like SZA comes on the radio, you know? And I'm just like, ah, and then the most beautiful like sun, sunrise happens at the exact same time. I'm just like, okay, this is, you know what I mean? And yeah. I guess it's like things that are in everyday life, but I don't mistake that for just being everyday life. Like this is meant to be, Yeah, this has to happen this way. When did you start looking for those or noticing those in your life? I think when I first moved to LA and I felt like um, communicating, you know, I felt like I was talking to my angels. I, it wasn't, it was like magic, you know what I mean? Like like seeing like angel numbers, like I believe in angel numbers mm -hmm, a lot. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a story. So I'm like sitting at this cafe, it's breakfast time, Old Town Roll, you know, just hit like number one on the charts. I'm already thinking in my head though, I'm moving to LA, I'm not gonna really like be super, you know, with my family and whatnot. Like I'm gonna do my own thing now. And I start seeing like this number, it was, and then I looked up what the number meant and it was like, you need to, you know, bring your family together. Basically it was like, you need to spend more time with your family you to bring your family together. I was like, um, I was like, um, no, I don't, <laughs> I don't think I'm gonna do that. And I just started seeing that number mm. over and over and over. And then I called my, I called my, uh, my siblings. I was like, I, I want to have our first, like, uh, what's it called? Family reunion. Mm. And I did that thing. And I started seeing a different number and I looked up what that number meant. And it was just like, you're on the right path. Like, and, and I kept seeing that number over and over. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So it was, it was something, it was something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, and, and that's, and that's been almost a discovery for you as opposed to something you were taught or trained or heard yeah. or learned. It's been self-taught almost. Yeah. And it, it, and it's also like something that felt very real because, you know, at that time, like I wasn't spiritual at all. You know, I didn't believe in any of the stuff and I was just like, okay, yeah, I see. I, I feel like you guys are there. I don't understand you completely, but yeah. 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 And what do you like when you like, can't see the sign or you can't find the answer? Is there something that helps you kind of realign or reconnect? I feel like at that point, I just have to trust what I feel in my heart, mm. you know? And I feel like there's a, there's a calm sense when I know something is right. Mm. There's like a, it's like a washing of, okay, this is good. Yeah. I can't explain it. Yeah, yeah I get yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, that that's the beauty of trying to explain in words things that are experienced intangibly, right? It's, it's hard. It's, it's challenging, but... I think anyone who's, I, I know a lot of our community and our audience is able to see signs or knows what their signs are and yeah. their experiences and what they are. And I officiated a wedding in December and the individual who's getting married always loves the uh, color blue yeah. and sees her father's presence as a butterfly. And when I was leading the ceremony, there was a moment in the ceremony that I asked everyone to close their eyes and meditate with us. And then we open our eyes and some of us still had our eyes closed and a blue butterfly literally just flew right through the garden. There was only one. It wasn't like we were in a butterfly park or, yeah. or something like that. And I can see that you, you can That's sense beautiful. your ability. And it was just, it was beautiful. Like it was one of those moments where everyone after was like, did you see the blue butterfly? Because they know how important it is to the bride. Yeah. And it was just this magical moment of, you know, for her to have her father's presence at her wedding who is no longer with us. That's like, beautiful, man. Yeah, it was really, really special. So... Yeah, I think for those for those who are on that path, who are aware of those things, I'm sure they'll they'll resonate with what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful, Montero. We end every episode with a final five. Yeah, uh, these are the fast five. They can only be answered in one word to one sentence maximum. We mm -hmm. ask them to every guest, uh, and you've been such a kind, gracious guest with your time. So, Montero, these are your final five. Question number one is: What is the best advice you've ever heard or received? Do it scared. I like that. Uh, second question, what is the worst advice you've ever heard or received? I, I don't know about that one. You block it out? Yeah, I, I don't have that one. Yeah, yeah. that's cool. Uh, question number three, what's the first thing you do in the morning and the last thing you do at night? First thing I do in the morning, um, 
I get my cats off the bed, <laughs> and the last thing I do at night, mm, I try to move my feet in a place where my cats won't scratch it in. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Uh, question number four. What's something that you used to value that you don't value anymore? I guess approval from everyone around me, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. You're allowing yourself to let that go. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Fifth and final question. We ask this to every guest who's ever been on the show. If you could create one law that everyone in the world had to follow, what would it be? Can I have a different one? <laughs> I love that. That's that's brilliant. I don't mean to have to break my law with you. Um, yeah. What advice would you give to your younger self? Make sure you love yourself enough more than than anybody else in this entire world like ever could. Yeah, I say that. That's it. Long live Montero. The documentary is out right now. Montero, Lil Nas X. It has been. Um, I know. I know for you. However the experience goes, I'd love to hear from you. But honestly, I think the depth, the openness, and I want to thank you for showing up when you didn't have to of your own accord and trusting me and giving me this space and time. So I'm grateful to you and thankful to you for showing up in the way that you did. Thank you. I'm happy to be here and I'm appreciative of, you know, how you've like helped me through this. Thank yeah. you. Appreciate cool. You. Thank you, man. Thank you so much. If you love this episode, you'll enjoy my conversation with Megan Trainer on breaking generational trauma and how to be confident from the inside out. My therapist told me stand in the mirror naked for five minutes. It was already tough for me to love my body, but after the C-section scar with all the stretch marks, now I'm looking at myself like I've been hacked. But day three when I did it, I was like, you know what? Her thighs are cute.